Hey everyone, welcome to Punkcast. My name is William Maxwell. I'm a student of Web3 and the owner of Punk9527. CryptoPunks are 10,000 uniquely generated characters stored permanently on the Ethereum blockchain. No punk is the same. This is a show dedicated to celebrating the punks behind the punk. My hope for this podcast is that we capture the essence of the punk culture, elevate the brand and the individual behind the punk. One last thing. Projects discussed on the show is not financial advice. Crypto and NFTs are a volatile and risky asset class. Please always do your own research. Other than that, let's go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Punkcast. Today, we're back with Punk9322. He's a three Addy, shadow beard, purple cap, and the pirate eye patch. In real life, he heads up strategy at Admit One, a G Money ecosystem membership NFT. He's previously worked at Amazon and Vayner 3. Please welcome Jiro to the show. Jiro, how are you? I'm great, Max. Wow, the uh, that intro just brings back all of your previous episodes to my mind, so it's awesome. Nice <laughs> to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. No, uh, th- thanks for coming on, man. I think um, we were just chatting before the show, but I think uh, you were one of the first punks I ever engaged with back in early uh, 2021 of the crazy ball run days when we were all DJing together. So... Uh, Nice to sort of finally meet and uh, unpack your story. Yeah, well, it's, well thank you. And it, it, it's funny. I, I still look back on these days, or those days. It feels like forever ago. But what's what's really amazing and remarkable is what a lot of these folks are doing now, right? You would have never guessed it. It's almost like this uh, graduating class of 2021, right? Late, late 2020, 2021. They're just off doing amazing things. So it's there is going to be a documentary made one day, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing all those stories. Yeah, so it's... Uh, yeah, we had those great times over the last couple of years. It's it's funny. Do you think um, you know we always talk about the the you know Harvard or the or the Yale class of a particular vintage would be like the ones that go on to do some amazing things? But I think like the class of twenty twenty one in crypto, I think will be the the ones that uh, turn out to be uh, the ones that actually do anything in the space. Yeah, well, it's uh, it is so true. I mean, some names come to mind for me, and I think names that you've had on this podcast as well. Like the one that I always go back to, a good friend of mine, Sergito, right? Like th- that guy is incredible, and I've seen his journey from Nifty Gateway to you know to uh, just shit posting on Twitter to now MeBits and you know all the amazing things he's doing, and it's uh, it's it, it's a, it's quite the journey. I mean, I think probably you know the folks who've lived through this last couple of years of the bear, I think if they're still around, they're doing amazing things. I mean, you can only shit post for full time on Twitter for so long. So I'm sure they're, they're all building amazing things. I remember, you, know, you might've seen this, Max. I remember seeing this uh, beautiful visual of uh, punks and what they're up to. They're, it's like a one pager. I don't know if, if, you, if you know what I'm talking about, but it talks about all the things you're building, what their uh, founders, investors, uh, and it's, uh, you know, the, the font on it is teeny tiny because of all, all of the punks mm-hmm. from all that one pager. So it's, it's incredible. So it's, it's a great class. Yeah, no, I have seen that. I don't, I can't remember who did that though, but yeah, it might be worthwhile for us to sort of dig out and share again. But um, but, but anyhow, I, I'm Jiro, super super happy that you're uh, on Punkcast family, and uh, thanks so much for joining. Um, maybe we could just start off with a simple question around: How did you get Jiro? Like, how did, what, what what was <laughs> what's the story behind that handle? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, to talk about that, I I have to kind of go back to the start of my my journey and. Um, you know, I think I'll, 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 maybe I'll save some of the early on stories for uh, a little bit later in the podcast, but one of the first projects I fell in love with, like many of us in 2021 was uh, Bored Apes, right? Bored Ape Yacht Club. Uh, and the, uh, you know, I, I've only owned, I think three apes amongst my kind of that early 2021 journey. But the first one that I bought, the one that I loved, he was a sushi ape with 3d glasses. Uh, and he just reminded me so much of the, his personality that I like projected, reminded me of uh, the chef uh, who I met in Japan. I mean, you, you remember that Netflix documentary, Memories mm. of Jiro, right? The yeah. beautiful sushi documentary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my wife and I had a chance to go out to Japan. This was a number of years ago, and, and we had a chance to dine there. And I'm like, oh, this is it. This is Jiro. Uh, so that so that name just stuck. Um, and yeah, I, mean, I remember, I think some of my earliest posts were just shit posting about sushi recipes. And I think I was talking about starting my own sushi NFT collection at one point. So it was very <laughs> much, it was, it was like straight to the point, like Giro sushi, that, that, that's me. Um, and, you know, I, I don't own, I don't own that ape anymore, but 
uh, the name still stuck. Like I, yeah, I, I didn't have the heart to ever change that name. So yeah, that's uh, that's a simple story on, on on my name. Amazing. Just out of curiosity, was that um, sushi place of Jiro's uh, any good? Like, uh, yeah, it was. Oh, always, yeah, it was. It was fantastic, man. Well, we we didn't actually have the uh, Jiro. I mean, I think at that point he had like retired or he was uh, really difficult to get a hold of. It was his son. Uh, who you know he was running the, the same location and it i mean it's uh it's a magical experience right because you're uh you know what, what really just caught me by surprise is just like the simplicity of everything and the location was super simple i mean it was outside of a metro um it was you know maybe six or seven people dining with us so the experience was fantastic and i'm a fast eater i like i mean you can i'm a bigger dude you can see me here um <laughs> i eat quite fast my wife's Teeny tiny Asian girl. I mean, she's like she's the slowest eater in the world. I mean, and the, just watching him watch us and serve us at the totally appropriate pace, appropriate for both of us, was was amazing. And it was it was just cool. It was it was great. I mean, we don't have. I mean, I'm in you know the, uh, Toronto. I'm happy to dox my location. I think it's on my Twitter profile. But I'm in Toronto. The sushi sushi's okay here. Vancouver is fantastic on the west coast of Canada. So I think for me, I'm just going from this like you know. My 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 uh, taste buds for sushi aren't that uh, that fine or refined. So when I had this, it just blew my mind. But yeah, that was about ten years ago, and I, I still remember it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can I can imagine. And um, just Tokyo and the food there is just mi- absolutely mind blowing. Just the amount of um, mastery they put into all of the dishes. You know, we we talk about in NFTs about being low effort or high effort. I mean, Japanese you know cuisine is like super super high effort. And um, yeah, now awesome. I, I need to go down and try that. And and Mate, so you're 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 from Toronto, um, and you know it seems like you've you've gone through a bit of a, a strategy journey with um, with what I've sort of seen you progress through Vayner and now obviously with uh, Admit One. Could you just maybe um, go through a bit of your background and you know how you know all the things about you that sort of led you to to this space? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's been a I've been really happy with the, with the journey, and I think it's funny because it feels like the right place, right time, and. I know the the historical experiences add up. You know, my my background is in marketing. Um, so marketing and sales has always been, you know, where I pursued my career. Um, I went to uni for marketing and uh, economics. I, I flipped back and forth between marketing and 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 truth uh, finance uh, for my degree. So I kind of kept switching my major. Uh, I was part of what's called a co-op program. I think they call it internships in other parts of the world, but. Um, so since the second year of uni, I had a chance to go work for different companies. Uh, and, you know, when I, when I would go work for a finance company, I would switch my major over to finance. But then I would realize I didn't really like the work. So I would go work for a marketing company. And it, it, would, it was this dance back and forth. But I ultimately uh, landed on marketing as, as my career path. Uh, one of my final um, uh, in, like co-ops that I had a chance to be placed in was with Procter & Gamble in Toronto. And you know, P and G is is this machine for for producing marketers, right? So my my job there was an assistant brand manager. Um, you know, and, and that that is the that's where you start your career, and everyone kind of hopes to be general manager one day of a P and G business line. But you know, I learned kind of all my chops there from you know business strategy. How do you conduct market research? Um, how do you formulate things like communication briefs? How do you work with agencies? You know, your supply chain. So it's very much like a generalist approach to running a business, and I would I'd still say today, like you know, I probably one of the best uh, four or five years of of learning I had. I mean, it was a job, but I, I learned an incredible amount. Um, so you know, started off in marketing in school, and then moved up uh, various roles at P and G, mostly in brand management, uh, and then I moved over to uh, a competitor or an, actually a CPG company, but within a different vertical, uh, the Mars Wrigley business, which is very much about chocolate confectionery uh, and and very different uh, you know marketing challenges over there. So I helped grow some of those businesses, uh, particularly our uh, online business. I mean, in Canada at the time, e-commerce was well underdeveloped compared to the U.S. or even to Europe. So one of my challenges was bringing kind of modernizing the Mars Canada business uh, to be uh, ready for the kind of the digital revolution. I mean, it happened at a great time. This was all pre-COVID, uh, and you know they were uh, set up well to go into uh, you know, the post-COVID world. Uh, but yeah, spent about another uh, three, four, I would say maybe four years at Mars. And then I took the leap over. I, you know, I enjoy, I enjoyed the digital side so much. Uh, I, I moved over to Amazon and uh, 
for, for the Amazon advertising business over there for about uh, another four or five years. Um, and, you know, that's where I would say I learned a whole different set of skills because, you know, CPG companies, I mean, <clears throat> they're very, they're very traditional marketers. So they're still talking about TV and, and newspaper and physical coupons. Um, so obviously, you know, working with Amazon advertising, it's a whole different ballgame when it comes to search, video, uh, you know, the uh, shopping based insights, the path to purchase was completely different. Um, so amazing, amazing, uh, you know, amazing uh, exposure there. Uh, and part of that offering within the Amazon advertising is the Twitch portfolio. Like Twitch was, you know, was owned by Amazon. And, you know, I'm a gamer, uh, always loved games growing up. Um, so for me, when I had a chance to work with Twitch and helping to promote that platform, uh, it just made a lot of sense to kind of uh, kind of lean towards gaming and kind of more of the creative side there. And, uh, you know, and eventually that's, that was around the time I um, got into exploring NFTs. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, probably I would say this was uh, late, oh gosh, uh, mid 2021 or so, I made the leap to go from the corporate world over to uh, Vayner. And I can tell you that story as well. That was a pretty, pretty hilarious story. So, but, but, but my background has always been marketing. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, set me up really nicely for the roles within Web3. Mm. Uh, amazing sort of uh, background and story too. Uh, um, I mean, between, fi- you said you sort of dang- dangled between sort of finance and, and marketing in your early days. Um, what sort of tipped you over the edge into marketing, do you think? I think it was, it was just, just the need for creativity. Um, and, you know, I think that was sorely missing for me, at least within the finance roles that I had a chance to, to work in. It was very much numbers based. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of room for creative interpretation. Actually, in fact, creative interpretation was frowned upon <laughs> uh, when you're talking about numbers. Um, so I was looking at more traditional like analyst type roles. And uh, at the time, we wasn't able just missing literally like the creative like visuals, working with ad agencies, uh, you know, being able to influence like what uh, TV copy and advertising physically look like. So it was a very uh, visual exercise that I was uh, that I was missing from finance at the time. Yeah, um, it, it's super interesting the way that you were describing it because I mean, uh, to be honest with you, I I went through the, the finance route, right, and um, instead of the marketing route, and and for the for the longest time, I, I probably was disrespecting marketing and I guess it's um, and, and as a discipline because it. If I remember back in university, the only reason why guys took up marketing was because that's where all the hot chicks used to go, right? <laughs> yep. Um, but but all the guys used to take all the economics and you know all the finance and and and, the, and hardcore stuff because they wanted to get into finance. And um, but I think as I, I sort of started working with some cor- corporates as well, um, really understood that you know marketing was you know was actually you know if you do, did it properly, it's very um, very quantitative based and um, very uh, I was going to say very clinical and very to the point. If you if you get a good marketer, they they understand exactly which segment and how you position things in the right way, and uh, it becomes super super important. And so, as you were describing that as well, I mean, I I was working for um, some supermarket chains here out of Australia, or consulting there as well, and just um, knowing what the merchandisers go. I mean, you spoke about path to purchase, you know, how do customers sort of look at things? Those insights are super valuable, and I think. Translating it across to NFTs, it's really interesting to sort of see the degeneracy because NFTs are a very retail, retail sort of um, product in some in some ways, um, and, and most of the times that we come across people that do well are the guys that come from finance, right? Because they understand trading, markets, liquidity. But I don't think we really have um, you know people like yourself or an abundance of people like yourself mm-hmm. that come from a retail sort of marketing sort of background angle too, which is, which is super interesting. Yeah. I, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's very fascinating for me because, you know, I think, so the work we're doing at 90CC is very much focused on, on the consumer traditional kind of retail perspective. But I mean, I think over this past year, um, what's been really exceptional is to see examples like Pudgy, right? Because, you know, uh, you know, this is very much following a traditional retail model, right? You get a licensing agreement, you get it into retail stores. You do a small test that performs well. Then you go national. You know, you build your IP that way. Um, so that is a very, you know, that is a, a hundred-year-old business model, but that is being kind of revitalized in Web three. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing way more of that. Um, you know, I think uh, we talked a little bit about uh, you know Gary and Vayner, but you know, I think they're 
they're also a model that uh, I think with V friends, he understood that from the very beginning. And what he launched that book uh, a couple of years back, right? Um, and that was done through you know an e-commerce platform. Well, you remember this one, right? But but enabled by NFT technology, Web three technology. Yeah. I think it's just smart. Jerry, why don't you get into that story about uh, Vayner? How, how did you get into Vayner? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's fascinating. It was probably the 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 weirdest um, job application process I've went through. So. I was, uh, you know, <laughs> I was working at Amazon, but my mind was definitely not there. I mean, I was like completely in NFTs. Um, you know, um, there was uh, at the time uh, Gary V and uh, Avery Avery Akinini, who's who was the president of Beta Three Vayner Media. Um, they had posted on Twitter saying, "Hey, look, we're building up this team. We want to hire from amongst the DGens, right? So, uh, you know, click here, uh, fill in this application." And we're going to have a uh, five-minute interview if you are selected. We're going to have a five-minute five minute interview with you to see if you'd be a good fit. So, <laughs> so I, you know, I, I said to my resume, uh, I talked a little bit about myself and my experience, and I was invited to get on for this interview. And it was literally five minutes. I mean, Gary Vee is probably one of the busiest people in the world. I mean, the, the man is insane. Uh, his work ethic is, is, is amazing. And I remember getting on the Zoom call, and it was it was just like this with Gary and, and uh, Avery on on two different lines, and they you know they just went like pow 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 like it was like literally a five minute interview, and <laughs> I remember at the end of it I was saying you know Gary was talking about something about around work ethic, and I remember pausing and he saying listen Gary I come from a you know a immigrant family you know I, I know what hard work is about I've seen you know my parents do this and myself do this so bless yeah you know my life and. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm here to roll up my sleeves. And I think that's all I had to say. I don't think the resume even mattered. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was a week later, I was uh, extended an offer and asked to join as their uh, VP of partnerships. And uh, that was, that was, uh, yeah, incredible, incredible journey over there. Yeah. I, rem- I remember that. Um, and I, I think I DM'd you at that time as well. So uh, that was, that was a fun time. And, and uh, I think uh, who else, another punk was recruited to Vayner 3 as well. I think Crypto Novo was. Um... Crypto Novo. It was it was like it was a fantastic uh, squad. We had Crypto Novo was there, who I know he's been on this pod before. Uh, Alan was there. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to think of Alan's uh, handle on Twitter, but he's pr- pretty notable on Twitter as well. Uh, and then we had a, a couple other folks who were, you know, uh, who I always assume were just degening in the space, but who are actually meaningfully building a business here uh, with Gary. So yeah, it, it was a it was a fun squad, and it was very much a you know a grassroots. Um, startup type environment, you know, Vayner had the established Vayner media business, which is a traditional ad agency, but, you know, Vayner 3 was really trying to carve out the expertise within Web3 uh, and, you know, A, build, bring in some of the clients from the existing Vayner uh, book of business, but then also go pursue other ones. So it was, it was just an incredible time just trying to, you know, build a team, trying to build a culture, trying to, you know, bring on clients, uh, trying to stay sharp on what's happening real time with the space and then and translating that all for a uh, Fortune 500 audience, which you know, <laughs> which has its uh, has its challenges for sure. Uh, but it was it was great fun. Was Vayner three part of Vayner, uh, Vayner Media or was it a standalone entity? Oh, I mean, the, I I want to say it's a standalone entity, but obviously they're they're you know quite connected in terms of uh, you know um, client relationships and personnel that go back and forth. But I want to okay. say it was a standalone entity. Yep. Yeah. yeah okay. Cool. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and it. Sort of makes sense, right, to um, recruit from the space because I think I was working on a couple projects um, as well, and I think we needed some help with just the marketing elements of it, right? And uh, I think when you go to traditional sort of space, I think we interviewed a few traditional marketing agencies, and they came back and sort of said, "Well, okay, well, tell us about your customer groups. Uh, you know, um, well, you know, we've got access to Instagram numbers and all that type of stuff." and they just they just really didn't understand the space and uh, how to market and and get reach and um and it had any insights i mean they hadn't even opened up a metamask wallet before and so i think you know uh, it, it, i think it's going to be very much needed for sure i think a lot of these corporates that really try and you know step into the space not only need to be uh, aware of those things but also need to understand the culture a little bit because i, I sort of sense that we are you know the web3 people are generally pretty protective and I think as soon as a company sort of steps in, I think they sort of automatically go, these guys are going to grift. <laughs> and, 
and so and how do you do it in a in an authentic non cringe way right and um so i think there's somebody like you know vayner 3 or a, you know an authentic sort of web 3 uh, consultancy is really really much needed well wow. well that's, and it's absolutely right and i think it's um it's interesting because i mean it, it is an incredibly long burn right to get these companies you know on board and ready to go in fact i would i would imagine some of the conversations i started having in 2021 prior to leaving vayner some of those, have, I mean, I'm sure still in the works, right? Like, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, there was, there was a Fortune 500 who, uh, you know, we were spending maybe about seven or eight months just onboarding their treasury team to be able to have crypto on the, on the books, essentially, right? And that was like step one for them trying to figure that out. So, you know, there was, it was a major coordination effort between, you know, companies like Coinbase and, and this company and the, you know, the CFO and, and getting their board comfortable and, it's a ma major endeavor, and, and those things, you know, even to schedule meetings would often take months at a time. So yeah, it, it's it's a it's a longer burn, and I think um, some of those companies are, I think, will be will be pleasantly surprised. I'd say over the next you know six months uh, on who ends up coming to market, um, and who's probably been working through the bear and prior to, but it just you know these companies move quite slow, as you know, right? So yeah, uh, yeah, unique challenge. And and what was your transition into um, admit one? Like, how did that all come about? Yes. Well, and, and you know, I think, um, and when I say Admit One, um, you know, th this is the entire G Money organization. So we have Admit One, uh, which is kind of our membership uh, a token, essentially. It's a community that, you know, we kind of give away these tokens for free to supporters of G. But then more importantly, what we're really focused on right now is 90CC, which is our, uh, our fashion line, where you're, you know, a luxury fashion brand. Um, and so that transition uh, to work with G as a whole was really interesting because actually it started even back when I was at Amazon. And I remember tweeting about Twitch and, and saying, look, we absolutely need to have more Web3 content on Twitch. It's such an opportunity. No one's talking about it today. And he was, G, uh, G Money was one of the first people to DM me when I, when I tweeted that out. And he's like, hey, I'm trying to build this business. I'm trying to build this brand. Uh, you know, how can, how can I work with Twitch? And, you know, we ended up jumping on a few calls and ultimately it led over a few months and he was like, you know, Hey, now's the right time. I'm starting this team. I want you to come, come hop on the team. Cause I think, you know, uh, you, know you could be a great addition. And this was around the time I was phasing or uh, out of Vayner three. I was like, okay, you know, and uh, time to go kind of work in something more kind of native within the space. Uh, and so I was in touch with G for quite some time, probably since early 2021. And, you know, I, I probably transitioned to uh, his team, uh, kind of more formally full time in, in tw early 2022, um, but it was just very much he was you know I think what what really got me interested with working with him was he understood at that especially at that time very few people understood the space the way he did um, you know I was I was always fascinated with um, you know his work to bring Visa uh, on board to buy CryptoPunk you know you remember that that madness back in 2021. Um, you know, his work with Adidas and I'm like, okay, this guy understood so, so it. I didn't, yeah, I didn't, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. So what was his, um, what was his role in, I guess, bringing Visa on? I think, well, I mean, I don't know the, the, the specifics of it cause I wasn't tightly working with him at the time, but I think it was a part of the conversations he was having with big companies, you know, broadly in, in, uh, mainstream, mainstream brands, Fortune 500 cause he's advisory has been a big part of what he does. Uh, those were part of those discussions around the importance of digital assets. So I think that planted some seeds that eventually brought them over it. But yeah, I mean, I should ask him for the exact details on that. You know, he does, it's a claim to fame that I know he has. So, <laughs> uh, so you know, for me, uh, that was the first person I spoke with um, as a personality within the space who had kind of a, a bigger vision for what he wanted to build uh, and kind of understood how, you know, traditional skill sets and levers could apply to the space. Um, so yeah, no, that, that was that was a uh, you know like a, I would say two and a half years in the making to come to that point. Um, but uh, yeah, and you know it's actually obviously brought me here today because I I'm going about two years with the team now, come uh, early in the year, early in the Amazing. new year. And I guess for um, the listeners out there as well uh, that aren't familiar, so could you describe what um, Admit One is and Nine DCC is? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, Admit One, uh, what is it? We at the all, at the end of the day, the way we think about it is this is a community uh, uh, that is all things G money, right? So this is kind of the ultimate kind of entry point into the G money ecosystem, um, and these were given away for free. So uh, you know, G, I would say quite early on, even in 2021, 
um, was very active at IRL events. Um, so uh, one of the things he always loved to do at this event is hand out POAPs. So anytime you would meet him in person, he would hand you a POAP. And so we had this database of hundreds of people who he had interacted with uh, through these tokens. And we wanted to find a way to build a community, um, get people really excited, supporting him. And so we had our own kind of team of advocates who were, uh, you know, who would always be around as we decided to take on different initiatives. Uh, and people who just want, were like-minded and wanted to connect. Um, and so what we decided to do, uh, we were, you know, we were looking at a lot of different pricing models when we wanted to launch Admit One. But ultimately what we landed on is let's make a treat. Let's give it to these folks, uh, for folks who've been supporters from the very beginning of G's efforts. And, uh, you know, we essentially handed out uh, a thousand of these uh, tokens to, uh, you know, uh, and at the height of the market, I mean, these had some really amazing retail value at the time. Um, but, you know, these were free tokens. We've had people holding these from day one. And really, you know, it, uh, it's all about connectivity, right? So it's it's an access point to G Money. It's an access point to the team. And we know we're going to be going off and building additional businesses on top of Admit One. So 90CC would be a great example. And I'll, and I'll talk about what that is in a sec. Uh, so Admin One was just about, okay, if, anytime we're going to do something, Admin One is going to be our first stop. This is going to be the focus group. This is going to be the consumer base we want to serve. Uh, these are the people we want to hear their voices from. Um, and, you know, I think even to this day, and that's two years in, I mean, it's still a very tight group of folks who are dedicated to, to supporting one another. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, what you would see is the composition of this group is you tend to have a lot of founders, you tend to have a lot of creators, builders. Um, so I would say it's a very, yeah, very lively, vibrant group and very much not necessarily focused on kind of the financial side of it. We haven't had additional drops or, you know, our own kind of like sub collections or anything like that. This has been a, a uh, interest group from in its purest form at the very beginning. Nice. And then just out of curiosity as well, like um, you, you said that you were dis dis discussing different pricing models and ended up being free. What was the thinking? I mean, I'm just trying to pick your marketing brain here. Like, what was your thought process around around that? The thinking here was just around trying to find ways to remove the financial component out of NFTs. And I mean, obviously, you know, at the height of the bull, I mean, this was that that was uh, that was a very much I mean, like a huge dynamic within the space. But we, we wanted to. We really wanted to, to focus on the people themselves. We wanted to focus on getting people to connect. We necessarily, we didn't necessarily want this idea of speculators coming in. And I think the moment you introduce, you know, a floor, uh, floor pricing and then try, we looked at auctions, we looked at Dutch auctions, we looked at fixed price points, and you know, everything we looked at had us generating a lot of revenue, but it also we knew it wouldn't be exactly the composition we wanted in the community, and and there was too much variability in where we saw that composition change and how it would change. Uh, and, you know, the second part of it is, you know, we felt that by supporting G early on, and these are folks who kind of paid their fee, kind of paid their dues. I mean, they, they've had conversations with him IRL. They've supported him through some of the activations he's done. They've met and had great conversations. So there was this uh, idea of familiarity already, and we didn't necessarily feel comfortable uh, we we wanted those people in the in the group, but we didn't necessarily feel comfortable charging them to come in. And then you know, I think the third piece is it's, um, we wanted to manage expectations as well, right? I think you know when you have a free mint, uh, when it's a gift to you, uh, you know, it's uh, the expectations of uh, of you know up only are taken away a little bit as well, right? Which you know it's something we can't control. I mean, we did and obviously end up seeing it become you know pretty expensive at at what point, but it's um, you know at least you know we weren't. Uh, adding fuel to that fire, right? Yeah, that makes sense. And and nine DCC, where where do you sort of see you know that going at some sort of stage? I, I only ask as well because um, you know, I'm part of Punk Ventures, the uh, venture arm of uh, Punk Dow, and we were able to um, uh, put a put a ticket in with nine uh, DCC. So uh, amazing. Yeah, I'm talking to an investor. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, you know, we we consider ourselves the OG crypto native luxury brand. And I, and I think that comes with, you know, A, a lot of responsibility to like authentically represent the space, right? And I think we're pretty proud of how we've been doing that. Um, you know, and and uh, over the really, over the last year, um, the, uh, the focus has really been to elevate this whole idea of digital and physical coming together. Uh, and as you think about products, because I, you know, I think we can probably all agree that like digital, it's like even the, ter the term, um, 
fidgetal, right? Um, it's it's uh, it's it, it, there's a there's almost a gimmickiness to it, uh, yeah, which I, I think we need I, to get I, past. I'm not lie. Right? I, I, I hate it, dude. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, like, yeah, I think G would be pretty upset if I if I used the word fidgetal to be honest. But yeah, so we, we call we call them network products. You know, we want to elevate the entire idea of digital and physical coming together, and it just makes sense that, that that's going to be kind of what the next the next evolution of kind of where where uh, this technology takes us. So I mean, look for us, the last year was just focused on proof of concept, right? So we had four mainline drops over the last year. Um, our first drop was iteration 01, and we called them iterations for a reason because we're because we're learning with every every drop. And iteration one was just a proof of concept for us. It was a really simple uh, black silhouette T, has super heavyweight. And I think we we sold a thousand of them for like five hundred dollars. It was it was a great success. We still see them. They're at conferences all over the place, and so that was really just very much a proof of concept. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, chip technology with the beautiful kind of scanning experience powered by IYK chips. So, uh, and then you know, iteration two for us was more around what can we do to gamify this a little bit. So we worked with Snowfro, right? And we had this amazing. I don't know if you were there, Max, but we had a um, live minting and uh, and production uh, lab set up in Art Basel last year. And we work with Snowfro. Okay, yeah. So we work with Snowfro to come up with uh, a 90cc Chromy Squiggle uh, variant, and uh, we essentially had a live minting. And uh, so users would walk in, push mint on an iPad. They would see their newly minted Chromy Squiggle 90cc visual, and then that would take off an entire four-minute production uh, production line in the back, where that uh, visual was printed onto your iteration two garment. The chip was programmed. It was packaged up and, and brought right to you, and uh, you know that was it was a blast. I mean, we were there for uh, five days running that workshop. You know, we had, <laughs> we had maybe uh, seven or eight minutes of downtime and about forty hours of operation, and there was a there was a virtual sale that which sold out in like seven. It was it was amazing. Um, and you know, I, I obviously working with someone like Eric uh, Snuffer was always always a pleasure. So that was that was you know this idea of art and physical coming together. And then, you know, more recently in uh, New York, we had our iteration three, our, our first play into baseball caps. And, you know, that was an amazing, uh, you know, a scavenger hunt that we uh, ran across all of Manhattan. We gave away 1,600 iteration, iteration threes by taking over a bodega in New York. And uh, it was incredible. I mean, we had it, we looked at the data and we had touched at least 25% of people that actually went to. New York NFT NYC that year, um, so incredible engagement. And then more recently, we we've, we've done a, um, a drop with Jeff Staple, the the lucky shit hat, which is a, a simple black silhouette hat with pigeon poop uh, done in embroidery. Um, so uh, and you know with with that one, it was all about working with the Stapleverse community and uh, and their uh, their PFP project Sapiens, and so bridging digital uh, digital wearable and physical garment together. So look, all that to say, like the last year has been. All about you know experimenting with different use cases for our product and um, kind of where we're going now is bringing all those learnings to a more scalable solution, which we're calling powered by 90cc, and that's uh, really essentially now we're working with creators, brands, artists to uh, to kind of power their own um, garment needs, and we're essentially becoming a partner to uh, to launch uh, merch and and products. So we think there was there's a big consumer opportunity there for sure, and it's. Uh, it's a space where you know I think uh, merch and apparel is probably uh, pro- uh, Web three has probably uh, done it one of the most poorly executed verticals I'd say today uh, when it comes to fashion. So we're looking to make that a lot easier for creators and uh, for brands. Amazing. Well, uh, definitely looking looking forward towards it, man. Hopefully, um, we can get some some cool punk stuff coming out at some stage. Hope so. Yeah. And um, just just going back a little bit to, into your uh, NFT journey, then, like, yeah, what what was your first NFT? Do you remember? Oh, of course, I remember. Oh, man, I remember for sure. Uh, it's uh, it's the last stand of the nation state with by uh, Slime Sunday, I, and I I love that piece. Uh, I still have it. Um, it's actually um, it was the it was I purchased it on Nifty Gateway, and I remember looking at it um, kind of like late twenty twenty. And I was, you know, just trying to understand the space, and I, I didn't jump into it, but um, right away. But then uh, I remember just when I when the time came to buy, I was just like, okay, this is this is the time. I feel ready, and I want to say this was about 
uh, January, early February of 2021. Um, and I actually bought it using a credit card <laughs> on, uh, on Nifty Gateway. And this is right around the time when, you know, Nifty was blowing up and all these pieces were, you know, everything was going like five, six, seven X. And I know I, I, you know, I saw it kind of go well, all the way up and all the way down, never sold and, and I still have it. Uh, but yeah, Don, Slime Sunday is a fantastic artist. I mean, I think this, what really spoke to me about that piece was just the, just the, the crypto narrative on obviously a very classic you know, Renaissance piece, right? Uh, just that, that Bitcoin take on it uh, and the fight between uh, crypto and the, and, uh, and the nation state, which obviously is still, still going strong today, right? Uh, probably even heating, heating up more today. I thought it was a relevant narrative. It's, it's an amazing piece. And I think, um, you know, because I, I started off my journey in Nifty Gateway too, and um, that was one of the, the main ones that was sort of floating around. And it, I think it just captures that moment so very well. I think um, in some ways, in the back of our minds, anybody that was in crypto and NFTs had this sort of idea of um, a renaissance happening very, very soon as well. And so I think Slime Sunday did a really good job on it. Um, yeah, and I, I love love Slime Sunday as an artist as well. I think um, I've collected a few of his stuff, um, which is a uh, which is probably a little bit loud for most, but um, but he's a really cool artist, and uh, yeah, really love that piece too. And, and I sort of see it on your background as well. And uh, uh, yeah, it's nice well. Thing. Funny enough, I'm I am not a uh, I'm I'm not a big big uh, Bitcoin maxi or anything like that by any means. I'm I'm actually probably underexposed on Bitcoin, but I think uh, to me it speaks about just a broader crypto space in general. And um, no, I think it, it's it's a you know, I think it's going to be representative of this entire era, right? I mean, I think uh, probably 2020 to 2024, 2025, it'll be this like historical piece uh, or uh, time frame, and I think it'll be probably one of our uh, flagship pieces that talks about you know, what actually happened in this time. Um, I mean, I, I've been collecting his subsequent, um, you know, Revenge of the Nation State um, as well. And I think he's had a, uh, another drop more recently, a couple of weeks back, been collecting all of them. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a no brainer now, regardless of the price, I'm going to, I'm going to pick it up, but uh, he, he's a, he's a great talent. Amazing. Um, yeah. So, so I think I'm pretty bullish on it too. I mean, f full disclosure, I've got, I've got two, two of the, uh, two pieces of the last, the last night of the nation state, but, um, so it was an open edition on the 7th of November, 2020. So if you think about og -ness, this is, you know, before the 2021 bull run. So I, I don't know, man, like, I think as time passes, I can just sort of see this piece having a spot, um, uh, in, 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 in highly sought after sort of collections and there's only 415 of them just checking the floor price now it's about three and a half thousand bucks which is like you know maybe one and a half eight or something like that that's not too bad feels reasonable right <laughs> so uh no that, that's, that's that's super amazing and then so from from that how did you get into crypto punks what was your sort of journey to crypto punk Yes. So, I mean, uh, you know, obviously I had uh, Nifty Gateway and then I had moved over to kind of experimenting on OpenSea and, and kind of seeing what's going on. And, you know, OpenSea always felt so intimidating to me, you know, by the way, because it, it just felt like there's way too much stuff there. I mean, I appreciated Nifty Gateway's like curated experience at the time. So I was, I very much did feel like I was like lost in sea for sure. Um, and, I, you know, I just started getting a lot more active on Twitter. Uh, I remember at that point, um, you know, after purchasing um, uh, on Nifty Gateway, I created my Twitter account. I started following more more prominent people in the space uh, and just trying to get an idea of landscape of what's going on. Spent a ton of time in discords uh, talking to anyone I can. I mean, I, I probably got quite a few like voice chats with a lot of different people. And the thing that kept coming up was uh, crypto punks. I mean, it was it was over and over again. It was not. I mean, it was hard to avoid. And I remember seeing a lot of the people I respected the most from the Nifty Gateway days, they would be uh, transitioning pretty quickly into uh, punks. And I see these avatars everywhere. I'm like, what is going on? And um, there, was a, there was a gentleman I used to follow on Twitter, um, Matty. I mean, he's, he's an Aussie. I mean, I don't know if you know, um, and he ended up building the MetaKey project, but he's been, uh, he, he went by DCL Blogger for a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was, man, he was... Uh, He's been talking about NFTs since like 2017, or maybe even longer. And I, I used to watch a lot of his videos and follow him on Twitter. And then I, I, I remember pinging him, I, DMing him, be cold DM, just being like, hey, man, what do you think of CryptoPunks? Should I buy one? Never heard back from him. But this was probably in like January when I messaged him, or January, February. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, 
I, I recognize that the the floor was getting a little bit, you know, too expensive for me at the time. I think it went from like money to six or seven ETH. So, you know, I continued going out with my journey, uh, eventually found uh, Board Ape Yacht Club. And I, I bought my first ape for 0.27 ETH. I still remember that number. <laughs> and then bought a, bought a couple of other uh, one or two apes afterwards. And I remember uh, come around May, June timing, that getting close to the summer, um, I was in striking zone of being able to buy a punk. I was like, hey, like if I sold this and if I sold that, if I brought some more fiat over, I think I'll, I can get my like, you know, 15 ETH together at the time to buy a punk. And I remember, you know, sitting my wife down in the backyard and we were talking about, hey, this, this doesn't make sense. Should we like throw down some real cash into this? And, uh, you know, we talked about it for a while and she's like, hey, I haven't ever heard you talk this much about a, a purchase before. Like, you know, we bought houses together. We bought home uh, cars together. But we, you, you've never been this like passionate about something. And I think you should do it. So I remember I, we, we, we brought a, a sizable uh, fiat amount into, uh, into our um, trading account. And uh, I, I ended up having to sell one of the apes as well. And I think at the time it was like a three ETH floor, which probably wasn't the best financial, <laughs> financial move actually in retrospect. But, um, and, you know, I was, I remember being able to make this purchase and I bought, um, punk, uh, oh, like six, three, six, two, right. My first punk was the, with the Mohawk, um, and the, the mask. And it was an amazing, it was an amazing moment. I mean, it was, you know, oh gosh, uh, June 28th, 29th, it was late June. And I remember just, uh, just being like, you know, it felt like a very important day for me. It felt like a milestone and uh, I knew <laughs> there would be like, never you know there would ideally be a uh never a time where i wouldn't be without a punk and that that's uh that was a day to change from my perspective on the space amazing I, I do remember that punk man and uh that that eye mask was uh super super iconic um of yours and then when did you transition into the punk you have now nine three two two yeah that was almost exactly a year afterwards so this was around when uh, so June 14th, 15th, uh, 2022, a year later. And at that, at that point, I think we had dipped back to the 40 ETH floor. I mean, it was you know quite you know quiet for a while in the, in the punks world. And I remember seeing this punk and it was, uh, it was just right above floor. Uh, and I knew I had to have it. Like, I mean, uh, it was like, look, whatever I have to do to get this one. I've always wanted a purple hat. I mean, there's, there's a couple of re <laughs> reasons for it. I mean, there's like, I, I remember seeing just like some, first of all, I love, I love the aesthetics of it. And secondly, I mean, there were some amazing people who I really looked up to at the time and still do who, who would rock the purple hat, right? I mean, purple hat, the, the former art block CTO, um, you know, Jake, he was, he was a purple hat punk, uh, you know, B from uh, beauty and the punk, uh, Gary V had a bunch of them. Uh, and, and there was this, uh, there was just, just this like, uh, a cohort of like people who work in strategy at a lot of different web three companies for whatever reason rock the purple hat so it became almost like a uh synonymous for me with some of those folks and i was like i had to have it i mean the the other piece is uh you know toronto toronto raptors i'm a big toronto raptors fan the, the basketball team and when toronto raptors franchise came to canada they were made fun of actually and people would call them like barney the, din the dinosaur because our, <laughs> our our raptor was a purple raptor but the hats the retro hats are all purple, man. They're they're beautiful. So it was just a nod to all of those things, and uh, uh, yeah, and you know, I, and look, as much as I love my previous punk, the, you get a lot, of, you get a lot of shits for having uh, the uh, that mohawk, the skinny mohawk, right? So it's not the most aesthetic. The, 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 the uh, dildo so, head. The, the dildo, dildo head. Mohawk. Okay, <laughs> this is. I thought it was a family friendly podcast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, so I was like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to treat it as if I just got a haircut and put a hat on. So it was great. So yeah, that was about a year later uh, after my first punk. Yeah, the, the, the purple hats are special, man. And um, Gary V, I remember when he came out and started sweeping punks, he had a special affinity with the, the purple hats. Um, and uh, I think at that time as well, he was rocking, um, do you remember uh, Bobby Hundreds? He had a special release with uh, a crypto punk hat and it had like a green zombie hat on a, a purple cap and it just I remember really popped. This. It was super cool. And um, I've been trying to find these. I haven't, oh, I haven't thought about it in over a year, but yes, I do remember those. Yeah. Those were, those were awesome. Yeah. So um, no, I, I can, I can see why you, you, you love the purple hat. Um, and it's a super, super cool punk too. So, um, so well done on that. And Thank um, you. so but if, um, if, if money wasn't an issue for you though, like um, 
what would be your dream punk, do you think? Oh, yeah. You know what? I did some homework here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> punk. Okay. You look this one up, Matt. It's punk 1526. And I think you'll know exactly why. The zo- zombie purple hat with my yes. patch and gold chain. Exactly. I, I don't know if you t- if you had a chance to talk to Chris Lyons. Um, you know, he's a, he's a VC investor. He has one of the the cleanest punks, in in my opinion. It's just a, you know, like a, I think he has like a messy hair and and a gold chain. It's it just looks amazing. And uh, I've always loved the gold chain, but to get one without squiggly hair is actually quite hard to do. I mean, if you if you want a floor gold chain, you have to you have to accept squiggly hair. But uh, oh, sorry, the the string hair, stringy hair. But I feel like the um, the zombie, uh, zombie punk kind of obviously reminds me a lot of my existing punk if he were to turn into a zombie and got himself a gold chain. So, yeah, uh, I think this one's pretty sick. The colors. This one yeah. is, this is, this is really sick. I mean, the, the colors just really pop. You got the yellow, the green, and the purple, just really, um, what are they? And the there? red. The and a little red. touch of red. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, f- funny you mentioned Chris Lyons because, um, uh, he, uh, was actually our DJ at, uh, Punk's Brunch Hong Kong. Oh, no, Ab- really? Okay. Uh, absolutely amazing. Um, he absolutely killed, killed the, uh, the decks, uh, playing Afro beats for, for the whole day. So, uh, amazing. Yeah, sh- sh- shout out to Chris Lyons. I need to try and get him on uh punk cast at some stage as well, but, um, yeah, am- amazing. And, uh, if you, if you look across, I guess the, uh, the punk community in general, like, do you, do you have a, a favorite punk or favorite punk personalities that come to mind? I mean, there's so many. I mean, I've been really fortunate, Max, because I've had a chance to actually like work with a lot of punks, right? And it's, um, you know, I would say it's like, you know, almost all of them have a, they have like, a, they have their persona that we all see and love on on socials and Twitter and podcasts. And then you get to like really work with them and understand how they operate and how they think and strate- strategically. So I've talked a lot about G. I mean, he's obviously one of them. G Money, I, I love him. Uh, you know, he's given me a lot of opportunities in this space. Um, you know, the, the gentleman I, I'd love to highlight is, uh, is, is Snowfro. I mean, is Eric, right? He is, uh, I think it's, you know, he's quite recognized as probably the nicest person within our space. But I think, um, and I'll, I'll say the reason I, I, I choose him in, in this example is I've never met someone who can, um, you know, his presence with a team when you're trying to work on complex problems is just quite exceptional. Like he brings this like mix of motivation, uh, you know, authority, uh, kindness, uh, but at all creativity, like just being on calls with them, ideating on stuff is just amazing. Uh, and I had the good fortune to leading up to our, our Basel execution last year to be on weekly calls with him for like, you know, four months straight. And, you know, I really got to know him and he, he got to know me a little bit as well. And um, so, yeah, I just love the way he thinks. And uh, yeah, I'm mean, obviously a great person. And I think um, for me, you know, he's a good representation of, operating at a really high caliber in terms of, you know, what you decide to pursue with, with whatever uh, you want to do in your, in your life and, uh, and doing that in a way that's like really authentic, right? Not, you know, feeling forced or not feeling like you can't be yourself. So yeah, he's a uh, man. I think he's, he's done a lot for, for punks and, and obviously our space more broadly as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, I need to try and get him on punk cast at one stage as well, but I just want to sort of line up all the ducks first, but, um, but I've had so many sort of people, I mean, like, for example, Pistol Pete, who was, um, was on, uh, Pixel Pete, I should say, and you know, they used to be flatmates together. So they go, they go way, way back, but everybody's just had really super positive things to sort of say about him. And, uh, seems like a genuine soul. And I think the way that everyone's describing it as well is it's, um, not only good for punks, but also very symbolic for web three as well. And hopefully that's what, um, sets a sort of standard for everybody in the space. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, uh, how would you describe punk culture for you? Oh, ah, man, punk culture. It, it's, uh, for me, I think, you know, there's a lot of words that I would, I would think about. I think the biggest one is leadership. Right. And I think like there is this idea of, um, uh, of servant leadership and which is a, very, very like nuanced version of leadership because traditionally you think of leadership as people who are like type A personality, follow me, I got the flag, let's go. Uh, but the, the idea of servant leadership for me, it's about, uh, you know, bringing everyone for the ride with you, um, you know, uh, helping people who need help, uh, you know, being, being a supporter, uh, you know, being inspirational, being great at what you do, but then also helping other people, forging the path for others, right? And there's this like collaborative nature of being a servant leader where 
it's not just about you. It's it's about like the team, bringing the team for the ride. And I and I think it's funny because I've seen, you know, obviously we have a lot of different personality types within the punk community. But I mean, I think one of the traits that make that bind all of us is like we we're 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 all thinking differently. We're trying to build things. We're trying to push things forward. But there's this very um, there's this kindness that's there where everyone wants to help each other out, right? And I think we definitely saw that. Uh, you know, in early years, I mean, those early, you know, uh, 2020, 2021 years for sure. Um, but I don't think that's changed a lot. I think we've def- we brought in a lot of new people into the community, but people aspire to punks because I think they they aspire to certain qualities in their life. And I think, um, you know, forging the path and bringing others for the long, uh, others along for the ride, I think is a, is a major part of that. And yeah, I think we're all leaders in, in that sense. No, it's a, I think that's a, uh, a nice way of putting it too. And I, I feel, I feel uh, the same way, uh, especially, you know, looking across Web3 and the space that we're in, there's a lot of grifters. And I think, um, you know, when you sort of look to some of the punks, they hopefully, um, uh, you know, shine that light. Um, how, how do you feel about V1 punks? <laughs> you know, um, to be like, I, 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 I've never really had a, Strong opinion on them, and I've definitely heard the different cases on you know on, on other people's opinions. For me, um, I think they're important. I think I mean they they exist, right? I mean, I don't know if you remember that M and M's commercial back in the day with M and M's and Santa Claus, and they run into each other, and they're both like they do exist, and then you know they, uh, they're surprised <laughs> that they exist. So I mean that's us. That's uh, V twos and V ones, and you know we we both exist, and I think uh, so. I think there's a there's a sense of acknowledgement around that. Um, you know, I think. My my opinion defaults back to the creator, right? So the, obviously there's this, there's the provenance, there's what's on chain, there is the hit the, the 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 real history. But you know, for me, uh, art and creation always goes back to the art and creator. And you know, as controversial as their statements were, you know, I I kind of look at what the artists said about it. And Larva Labs, them obviously they had a very clear very clear perspective. Probably not the most. Uh, politically correct opinion but it was a very clear perspective on it so you know i'm like okay great like if the creator says this is this was kind of a first draft it's not really that important uh but here's the actual artwork and here's what we're 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 looking to build behind it um you know i, I kind of take that perspective as well so i think the v ones are important i think they're a big part of the the history uh i think there's certainly uh a collectability there i think you know um which is not a you know it's not a new concept i think that people will always want to have the misprints they'll always want to have like the first prototype uh but yeah i think uh there's a reason it's probably not as uh strong as you know the crypto punks community and um, there's you know there's many reasons behind that i think and part of that is what the artists have defined as what their creation actually is well said and uh how do you feel about the yuga acquisition of the sale of punks to yuga man i love it i absolutely love it okay so and I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you why the I feel like, uh, and I wrote, I remember writing this um, this thread about me bits about twenty, uh, you know, uh, last year or so. And one of the things I talked about that I was really excited for the me bits project, and it applies to the punks as well, is you uh, to take the the project to a, to another level. I think there's a level of stewardship that is required, right? And you know, I think we saw from. Larva Labs for quite a while. I mean, you know, they had put this out there and they were, you know, moving on to other projects. They were kind of done with this. And, you know, I think, um, yeah, that stewardship is very important. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to do a whole lot of things and have a roadmap and all these, you know, crazy things that, you know, a lot of projects fall into. But I think there's, there needs to be a, a guiding force, in my opinion, for any project, for any, any, any kind of venture, any kind of like creative direction. Um, so I loved it when I saw, when I saw that news, I was over the moon. I know a lot of people were upset, uh, but I think you know the provenance of having this project come from Larva Labs and then giving it into the hands of uh, Yuga, which I think uh, you know, um, arguably one of the best you know marketers in the space, right? I mean, like they've been able to build uh, a pretty big empire pretty quickly, um, and so I think you're giving you're having that kind of marketing, that strategic thinking, the resources, um, and just like just the go to market potential uh, that you've got always brings to the table. I think it's a great thing. I've been, that being said though, I've been very, very happy with, uh, you know, the direction they've been taking punks in. I think it's been very reasonable. I think it's very careful. Um, I think it's very thoughtful. Um, so yeah, I, I was very happy with the announcement and I think it's in pretty good hands. Um, and, you know, I'm like, I, you know, I think the, 
the most recent campaign around um, punk interviews, right? Like uh, with prominent people in the space, uh, the uh, the avant art execution, which you know I I, I was all over, like I, I had to have that. I think it's being done in a tasteful way, and uh, I'm very supportive of it. And I I, I think that's something um, you know Larva Labs probably wouldn't have thought to do as kind of their natural intentions as, as creators. I think those guys are very much focused on, on the tech and, and kind of where they want to, where they want to take the tech. So yeah, I, I think it was a great thing. Let me ask you another question, like with your marketing strategy sort of hat on, like what would be a good outcome for punks? Do you think like in the next you know, three to five years, but what, what would you like to sort of see for punks? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think for punks, Helping to shepherd the recognition of punks as truly pieces of art, I think is is there is kind of the ultimate direction in my mind. You know, I think um, we're well on our way to doing that, right? Obviously, you know, we're we're seeing it happen. I mean, the Papa do I haven't seen I haven't actually seen them myself, but you know, the fact that we have pieces in major museums like the Papa do I think is fantastic. Um, but I think the you know. Crypto punks being recognized as art, I think there's a, there's a couple of battles that need to happen, right? I think one is this push forward of, uh, of digital art being given the same respect as traditional art. So I think there's, there are definitely fights there, and that fight is happening on a lot of different fronts. So, you know, I think people like Yuga Lives will help have that fight on our behalf, and I think that's great. Uh, and I think the second part of it is you also need to have, you know, influence people within, you know, that traditional uh, gate kept sector that need to be convinced and broken down. And there, there needs to be some discourse there and some almost like um, con converting some of the old guard from the from within needs to happen. And that's one of the things I really loved about you know, having Noah um, or formerly on that role as CryptoPunks brand lead, because he, he, he comes from that world and I think he, he did a great job, you know, setting that setting these things in motion so i think yeah there's still some work to be done but i think uh, ultimately for me i would love to see this as a you know decentralized piece of you know uh of digital art you know it's a it's, it's ten thousand in nature but and it, it sits in the hands of people all over the world some people who are completely digitally native uh but it'll forever you know be ingrained in history as this piece of art that, that cannot be destroyed either right you know, no fire no no, uh, no war will, will, would help, uh, would uh, break it down, right? So, yeah, I think art is the ultimate direction, but that doesn't just happen, right? I think there's like, there needs to be intentionality to get there. And I think uh, they're well on their way. I think you, you you bring up a good point as well, because I think, you know, just hearing a lot of feedback from punks as well, they, I think we like the idea of decentralization, but the reality is you need a little bit of centralization to enable some of these things, like literally getting a plan coordinated sort of movement, you know, door knocking on some of these museums, you know, having, you know, appropriate sort of discourse around punks and what they are and educating the sort of market that, I mean, that needs fundamental resources, right? So um, I think that is a, that is definitely a good thing to have somebody like you at the helm to sort of do that. Let me ask you, let me ask you something else then. Uh, are punks better in museums or in the hands of users like, for example, you and I or community members like you and I? Depends what we mean by better, right? I mean, is are we talking uh, just you know what I would define as better? Th there is elevating, continue to elevate uh, punks as a piece of art, as 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 an important relic in in history, you know, within art history, but within history in general. Um, and I think um, the beauty of it is, like, I don't think we need to choose, right? I think you can you can have both. I mean, this is this is clearly the benefit of having something that's a digital uh you know blockchain based piece of artwork or piece of you know a big piece of technology it's, it can do both and i think that's exactly what it's doing i mean i'll and I'll, I'll let me if I take a step back for a sec you know i i happily ordered my emond art piece of my punk and it's uh, it's going to sit in my office i'm very excited for it you know we'll see what it gets here but i'm i am almost placing some uh physical value in that piece cuz i'm like okay great this is an authenticated like print of this product that is a piece of art that's going to live with me. But at the same time, that's not what most people are going to see. Most people are going to see me on Twitter. Most people are going to see me, uh, you know, on Telegram and Discord. And the impressions that these digital touch points will drive is vastly further, bigger, and much grander than 
the impressions that the physical is going to generate. But for me, that being in an in intimate space for me within my home is so important because there's something there. I can look at it, it when I walk by, I can touch it. Great. So, you know, and so I think there's a, but there's nothing stopping it from being both. Right. And so I think that's the beauty of the beauty of what punks is going to be able to do and what it's already doing is it is in our hands already. And that's part of what uh, makes it so special because it, there's a, it's being used. There's like this patina to it because people will see it. I, you know, it gets, it's been on my profile since, you know, X amount of days. And so there's some a digital patina to it. But at the same time, you know, I think it can live physically somewhere as well. So yeah, I, th I think it can be both max. Yeah, I got, got you. I, I think the way I was, and the way you described um, makes, makes a lot of sense too. But I think the way that I was thinking about it was like almost if you had like a, you know, a really nice old school vintage Ferrari, is it better just to showcase it or to actually drive it? And, um, and, I, and I'm sort of wondering between the two, right? Because I sort of feel like if it's just locked up in there, in a museum, it's nice for everybody to see, but nobody's actually using it. To... But that's the beauty of this one, I think. It's because then I think it goes kind of, it's like, it, it, it's a Ferrari that you can use and drive around and, you know, beat up, but it never gets, um, it never gets dented. It never gets dirty, right? Uh, so I think there's something. <laughs> there's well, something well you, you, could, yeah. you could probably argue that it get, if it gets moved around on chain too much, that mm. it starts getting a little bit dirty. Like, I hate yes. seeing wrapped punks like on, you know, wrapped, unwrapped. It just looks, looks like a, a used car. I, I know that sounds bad, but, uh, <laughs> but, but getting, but getting, but getting something with a clean sort of trading history and provenance from, you know, uh, you know, people with stories like, and this is why like, you know, having this, this on-chain history is really important, like, or, or really interesting too. I mean, you know, if you could trace back your lineage and, and basically almost what punk cast is trying to do is over time is that, you know, it'd be really cool to listen to all the punks that came before you that were using it for something, right? Um, and, and passing that sort of le legacy down. Um, and I think that adds a little bit of context and value to this, this, this individual sort of piece as well, right? Oh, no, no, no. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And it's funny because it reminds me, I don't know if you had this experience as well, but I remember when I first purchased my 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 first punk, um, the uh, the the original owner of it DM me on Twitter, and he was like, "Hey, like, congrats! Like, you know, I hope uh, I hope you you know take good care of it." And it was a special moment. It was it was really quick. I don't think I've spoken to them again uh, since, but it was it was a nice little moment. Um, so yeah, I think there is some like shared shared history and provenance there for sure. It's a good comparison to make. I think. Um... It'd be interesting to see what other punks sort of think about that too. I might, I might add that question in. And uh, if you could pass on a message to the next owner of your punk, 9322, what would you like to say to them? Well, I'm hoping it's going to be um, my, one of my children, hopefully. Um, and you know, it's, and uh, what I would say to them is, I think increasingly there's going to be responsibility that comes with uh, holding a punk. Uh, I definitely don't look at it as a, you know, a financial instrument more than a, you know, I think a, a, an artifact that's really important. You know, we, I, I come from a culture where like symbolism is really important, right? You know, we still have, we have a dedicated room in my parents' home where we have, you know, literally pictures or drawings of like all of our, you know, like, uh, members of our family from past generations. And, you know, they're there with, you know, other spiritual representations and stuff. And so that symbolism is important. And, and I think um, I would I would tell them like be a good steward, uh, take good care of uh, you know the punk, uh, take good uh, care of the community, you know be a be a part of that you know a servant leadership mentality that I think we all kind of seek to do within this community or and, and help things uh, help push things forward. Um, and I think it's going to look very different for future owners because I think the space is going to look very different. But I think there's a sense of uh, responsibility that comes with that, and I think you know part of my goal is to, to help educate kind of the, the, the next generation of, uh, of folks who come into this space on what that's all about. And, and certainly within, uh, you know, whoever, whoever, or, uh, you know, whatever institution or whatever ends up getting kind of, you know, these assets that I'm holding, um, I, uh, teaching them to the importance of kind of what these mean to me as well. I think it's going to be important. Amazing. Who would have thought these, uh, pixelated pictures had, uh, so much weight and responsibility on their shoulders coming. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. 
Jiro, this is super fun, man. Thank you so much for joining Punkcast. Um, really loved our conversation and would love to sort of uh, connect with you in real life at some stage. Um, but, um, you know, any sort of final closing comments on your side and, you know, what's the best way for people to find you? No, um, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. I mean, I know we've been trying to do this for quite a while and I'm glad we were able to. I think I, I love the work you're doing here. And that's, I appreciate it. Um, no, I think for me, what's, uh, what's going on with me is we're continuing to hammer home with uh, 90CC. There's a really ambitious um, set of projects for 2024. So myself and the team, we're, we're, we're thinking, just thinking about this stuff every day and building towards it. So uh, that's great. Uh, I can be found at Jiro NFT on Twitter. Uh, always happy to connect with folks. And uh, yeah, again, big fan of the show. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Guys, that wraps up another episode of Punk Cast for the week. And uh, we'll be back next week with uh, another amazing punk. Bye for now. Bye.